Good morning, guys. Let's take about 10 seconds and get everybody in place. All right, looks like we're all just about ready to get seated and uh, get this thing going. Um, remember, guys, we're live streamed today, so uh, don't yell out anything you don't want the whole world to hear. Uh, do not put your finger up your nose or in your ear. Uh, everyone will see it, and it is being recorded for uh, posterity's sake. So I want to welcome you to the CCA today. Beautiful campus. Thank you to CEO Ms. Brower and to Principal Pierce for letting us uh, use the conference room today. This place gets used so much, and it is such an asset to our school system and to our community. So thank you guys for opening the uh, CCA for us today. Uh, I'm Superintendent Nix, or as the elementary kids call me when I go visit, he's the Superintendo, and uh, I love that. Uh, they, they don't forget it. Um, and uh, I'm so glad that you are here. So I've got a couple of things planned today, and I'll kind of let you know how this is going to roll out. I'm not, I have a small role today. We have some incredible instructors, trainers, teachers uh, from the state that are going to really, really get us involved and help you understand what your role is as a member of your local school governance team. So uh, local school governance team. Local school governance team. The key word is team. Team. Team stands for together everyone achieves more. Teamwork makes the dream work, right? And at LSGT is simply put, it's a, it's a, it's a partnership. It is, the, it is a partnership like no other partnership in any other organization. Anytime I'm dealing with a student, I know that I need that parent's support or it's never going to work. Mama rules, Trump teacher rules every day, right? We have to be on the same team. There has to be a partnership. And that's what local school governance is about. It is a partnership. And today you're going to learn what your role is in that partnership and how you can better support uh, the students in your particular building. Um, before I introduce our speakers today, I do want to make a couple of introductions as we go around. Uh, I would like to introduce our board today and thank them for sacrificing their time to come out. These are my bosses. Please tell them lots of good things about me if you get an opportunity. He is an amazing superintendent. I think he's even lost a, lost a little weight. Uh, that would help too. Uh, but they are amazing, and I'm telling you guys, I say this every time I get an opportunity, great school systems, great school districts start and end with a great board. I promise you that. One thing I have learned as a superintendent, as I go across the state, when you have a dysfunctional school board, you have a dysfunctional school system. I promise you that. It's the most important job in our community. They are our true elected leaders, and I do want you to know that, and I want to recognize them today. Ms. Gibson, would you stand up, please? And you can just stay standing. This is Susan Gibson. She is our school board uh, member that's at large. That means everybody in the county votes for uh, Ms. Gibson. Ms. Hunt, would you stand up, please? Ms. Gloria Hunt is uh, a retired educator. She was in our school system for a long, long time, a media specialist, and uh, she is, uh, her uh, daughter-in-law is actually here. Ms. Shanika Hunt is a counselor at the Career Academy, so I want you to notice her. And then also want to recognize our board chair. He's been here. He's a new guy. He's only been here for a couple of years, 20 or so, 25. Uh, but Chairman Don Dacus has done so much for our school system, and they give so much of their time. They help me in every single board meeting. They give me great advice um, and wonderful support, and I would really, really, really want you to see them, and please recognize them and give them a hand.
Now, what I want to do now is I want to take just a second, and we're going to go around the room. We've got to do this really, really quick because there are 18 schools in here, and if we take a minute each, we're 20 minutes in. So, principals, I just want you to kind of stand up. When I call on you, I'll just point to your table. Just kind of wave because I want our speakers to be able to kind of identify who's the principal and what school are they talking to. You can say I'm at such and such elementary school. I'm so and so. You got it. We've done this before. We'll start right here, Mr. Langford. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you, Ronnie. Somebody follow direction. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Julie. Matt, right here. In the back, somebody stand up. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And their principal and uh, CEO are both here in the room. Are you all by yourself, young lady? I think I know you. I'm going to put you on the microphone. I'm Charlotte Reese. I'm uh, Dr. Trevelyan Secretary at Heritage Middle. And she is representing her entire table. There's something going on at Heritage Middle today, and so I appreciate you showing up, Charlotte. Right here in the back. Thank you, Dr. McCrary. Jennifer Scott, thank you. And the chicken master. He has a chicken coop down at his place. It's amazing. If you ever go to Wood Station, make sure you visit the chicken coop. Ringo High School today, and they have an exciting day. If they have to get out early, it's because they're headed to the playoffs at 1 o'clock, and I'm going to try to be there and wish them off. They have a carnival of buses headed south. So good luck with the Tigers today. I love it. Thank you guys for being here today. Thank you so much, Miss Hood. No, we did save the best for last. And with that, guys, I want to introduce our speakers, and then we will get started. So, Dr. Plunkett has done everything in the world. She has been a true friend to me, and she is a true partner in helping us get our Career Academy open. And you're going to learn a lot from her. They asked me not to tell all their bios, so I'm not. I had them written down. They said, introduce us, and let's get going. And uh, that, so that's what we're going to do. Dr. Paul Saban, you got any Alabama fans out here? This is Nick Saban's brother. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. No, I'm just kidding. So Dr. Saban is here today. They're going to partner up and give you guys a lot of great information. And then finally, Mr. Eric Waters, CEO of a uh, career academy just like this. And they're going to take this away now and get everything going. So I'm done. Is there anything I'm missing, guys, that you need? Uh, remote. A clicker. Yeah. All right, and we can click for you. So go ahead and mic up. By your table. Oh, I should put it, okay. It's coming. Okay. So with that, I'm going to turn this off and you guys should be ready to go. Thank you. Can y'all hear me okay? All righty. Hey, listen, I just want to say one thing, and this is from Eric and me. If he had been Nick Saban's brother, he would not have been in our truck with us this morning. <laughs> so I just want to say that. Um, we are so excited to be here. I feel like I've been through this charter system journey with y'all for a long, long time because um, I was a, the superintendent in Floyd County Schools. We became a charter system in 2010. And at about that time, um, your superintendent at the time called me and she said, so I want to know how it's going, talk to me about it. So I would make various trips up here and she would come down to Floyd and see the work we were doing. And then when I retired, I um, did not intend to go to work, but I failed miserably at retirement. So I became a, a consultant for the Charter System Foundation. And I'll tell you a little bit about who we are in a few minutes, but that is the best job I ever had other than being a grandmother. It is so much fun. What um, we do is we go around the state um, supporting the work of Charter Systems, all of the ones in North Georgia belong to Eric and me. Paul is with the Technical College System of Georgia, and Paul is also 
a retiree failure. So he was CEO at the Bartow College and Career Academy. And one of the things we love is that we just get to see this great work going on all over the state. So before we, we really get started, Eric and Paul, could you introduce yourselves for us real quick? All right, let's see if I got volume here. First of all, I am not related to Nick Saban. I am a Georgia fan and Ohio State. Go dogs. So it's gonna be really conflicting what's gonna happen here, right? <laughs> so uh, I am Paul Saban, and I'll start off by telling you, I am a practitioner. Um, I did 30 years in education. I was the, I've been a high school principal, middle school principal, math and science teacher. My last 10 years though were my greatest 10 years because I really got a chance to see what we can do in our communities through a college and career academy, through uh, apprenticeships, through work-based learning. And so in conjunction with some really great high schools and, uh, and theater schools, we were able to really create some great opportunities for our students, but more importantly, for our community. And so I look forward to sharing some more of that with you as we proceed and go on. But first of all, as a lifelong educator, I wanna say this, it does my heart great to see this many people coming to a location as governance teams to just really put the emphasis on what we're doing for our students and what we're doing for our community. I can't imagine that there's anything that you all can't do as a group that is in here today. So I look forward to work with you. Test, test, all right, it's working. Hey, my name is Eric Waters and this is an exciting day today. Uh, I am not a career educator. I was in corporate leadership, small business owner, and I was in education for 22 years after that. And I was uh, at, in Bartow County, and then Lynn stole me away to Floyd County, where I was the CEO principal of the College and Career Academy. And I think to echo everybody else here, we're very passionate about what we're going to do and what we can do to support you. And I just would like to echo what Paul said. That I see a lot of positive, I feel a lot of positive vibes in this room, and it is it's outstanding. We don't always get this turnout. I'll just, mm -hmm. just be honest with you. So it, it, kudos to everybody in this room. So we're going to try to have a little bit of fun today, and we're going to learn, and we're going to be interactive. So anytime you feel like asking a question, fire away, please. Okay, good news is, you don't hear me now? I never thought I had a question. Oh, and I have uh, two granddaughters and another uh, grandson or daughter on the way. Just want to add that. And that's, that's, his, that's his job now. That's my job. Um, one of the things that I wanted to tell you is that the three of us, began this work with Charter System, that would be Eric and I, and um, very early on. Paul began the College and Career Academy work very early on. And back in the days when we were doing this and really kind of getting this started as CEOs and as a superintendent, we were literally building that airplane while we were flying it. And there were a lot of things we learned along the way. So a whole lot of what we talk about today is coming from lessons learned, but it's also coming from what we've learned in working across this state and working with school governance teams, working with college and career academies, working with superintendents, and seeing this work evolve over the last 12, 13, 14 years. Um, and, and it's really great work. Okay, right up here you'll see a slide about the college. Oh, let me tell you one other thing first. We're not gonna be here at 12 o'clock. We are not. Don't clap. Uh, no, we're not gonna be here at 12 o'clock. We're not gonna be here at 12 o'clock. You can clap and we'll bow, okay? But we are not gonna be here at 12 o'clock because we, first of all, y'all are doing this as SGT members voluntarily and we appreciate that so much. Board members, Whatever they pay you is not enough, I can promise you that. And the rest of you in this room who are educators, there's just not enough money to pay y'all enough for what you do. So we wanna be very cognizant of your time and we know you got a lot of stuff going on, so we think about two hours and we're gonna be done. But we do wanna have some good conversation. We wanna be sure you have your questions answered. We wanna be sure that um, you all have this opportunity to talk together and then if we're, when we finish, if three or four days from now you think of something, email us. Let us know and we'll send you or text us and we'll get right back with you, okay? All right, let me tell you a little bit about the foundation and then I'm going to get Paul to tell you a little bit about his organization he's with because you're going to hear us talk about Charter System Foundation and Technical College System of Georgia a whole lot this morning. The Charter System Foundation is a nonprofit organization 
We are 10 years old. We just had our annual conference in Athens. And at the, the, the end of the first day, Harry Dog came into our, our conference room. And it happened to be my birthday on Monday. So I got a picture with Harry Dog, which was probably the best thing that I could even think of. My grandkids are super, super impressed with me now. But it was our 10th anniversary, and we cannot believe we've been in existence for 10 years. We started out with two employees and one consultant. We now still have two full-time employees, and that would be Senator Dan Weber, former Senator Dan Weber. Dan is a former state senator, and he actually wrote the charter system law. He is an attorney. He does not practice law now. He practices supporting charter systems full time. But Dan worked very, very closely with our former Lieutenant Governor Casey Cagle. That's how charter systems came around. And we'll talk a lot this morning about what the law says about charter systems. Um, we have Pam Talmadge. She's our executive assistant. And I have no idea how that lady gets done what she does. It is amazing to me. We have two teams of consultants. We have the um, Governance and Flexibility Support Group. That's the one I work with. And then we have three of us who divide the state into geographical districts. Uh, we are all former superintendents. We have all been in charter systems. We have all done that work that, that you all are doing, and we've walked in those same trenches you all walk in. And sometimes we have to get back in the trenches with some of our charter systems, and we walk then. Um, we have our career development team, and that's the one that Eric is on. And Eric, you want to tell me a little bit about what y'all do? A little bit of everything. Like Paul said, uh, we are practitioners, so anything from career pathway development to technical issues with the CTA budget to uh, work-based learning, youth apprenticeship, uh, strategic planning, board training, et cetera, et cetera. So when I first started uh, as a high school principal, um, you know, we had students doing dual enrollment. They would go typically to one of our traditional uh, four-year high school or colleges like Kennesaw State or Georgia State, and they were kind of the exception. Uh, then occasionally we would have students go to uh, one of our technical schools, but typically those were all for academic type uh, courses. So over the last 10 years though, there's been a real, real emphasis on creating opportunities for students in multiple pathways. And the technical college system has really begun to shift their thinking about getting students to work earlier, those students who want to get to work earlier, who know that they have a drive for a career. And so they really have, uh, we are working to develop programs where students while in high school can be earning those dual credits, not only in academic, which is great, we want as many students to do that as well, get that highest um, diploma they can possibly get. But in addition to that, now they can also be working in their career pathways and earning credentials and certificates and even associate's degrees while in high school. And the great thing about all that, for all, how many of you here are parents? Any parents in here? Yeah, I imagine a few. You know how much it costs for them to be able to do that? Typically, zero dollars. And those opportunities are growing. And the technical college system is really working with high schools. They're working with partners in industry and business to develop even more of those pathways. So, I'm excited about not only what we're doing, but what opportunities we're gonna have. And part of your charter flexibility is the College and Career Academy. And so the opportunities that not only exist for your whole system, but can really get focused through that College and Career Academy. So I look forward to working with you. So I actually just started working with them about six months ago, but I've been working with the technical college system as a high school principal for a long time. So uh, I, I'm gonna share a little bit more about that later. So that's a little bit about the technical college system. So when you hear us talk about Charter System Foundation or TCSG, now you know what we're talking about. All right, one of the things I did wanna mention before we kind of move on into the middle of everything is that I had this really, like it, it, this thought that just struck me. Um, Monday, and I mean Tuesday and Wednesday, we were at this found, uh, foundation conference and the conference focuses, and if you all did not get to go this year, look for the charter on the charter system website or talk to Marissa or talk to Chance. They, we have one every year. It's in Athens. It's a two-day event. It's wonderful. It's absolutely wonderful. And basically all it costs you is what your banquet lunch costs. I mean, it's a probably the, the most expensive conference you've ever attended in your life. But we devote those two days to letting our charter systems talk about what they're doing, talk about how they're doing it, sharing ideas, sharing practices. 
discussing issues that are very, very relevant right now. Um, get talking about, you know, having speakers coming in that work in small group settings with our attendees, um, having the opportunity for parents to interact. So it's just a great, great, great conference. And I also want to say kudos to Katusa because you all had um, Marissa Brower on two of our panel discussions talking about what you're doing up here. One was on the Peach State tax credit and the other is what you're doing in your law enforcement pathway. So um, people from all over the state got to see what you're doing in Catoosa County. So it was just great. But this thought that I had, I was sitting there and I was thinking, wow, you know, I told you we were building the airplane and flying it in 2010 when I was superintendent, first, first started our charter system work. Nobody would have ever made me believe when I was sitting there doing this work that I would come back 10, 11 years later and I would sit at a conference and hear the kinds of opportunities out there for kids, for communities, for I mean, families. It was amazing to me. I was just, I was blown away. I was absolutely blown away. And so one of the things I'd like to point out to you is that we have our website up here. And if you go on that website, we just have a ton of information. I mean, it's like information overload. But we have one um, link, and you can click on to a couple of different links. One of them, you can click on to a document, and it's called Flexibility in Action. We keep a running document of all of the different um, innovations and the ways flexibility is being used and all these different awesome things that districts are doing all over the state, charter systems are doing. And you can go in there and look at them. You can find contact information. So if you have an issue you're dealing with, you can go to this um, website and you can find somebody else who's dealing with it and they found a way that they're addressing it. And if you want more information, pick up the phone and call them. We also have videos from all 48 of our charter systems, and, and Katusa is one of those, but you can look at those videos, they're very short, they're like three to five minutes, and it highlights different innovations and different things that are going on in that system. And it's just a, a really powerful way of sharing what's going on around the state. And that's the one thing about us in charter systems, we don't take the good stuff we're doing and hang on to it and hold it to ourselves. We don't believe in that. We share it out because we know the stronger each of us gets, the stronger our state gets, the stronger our regions get. And so that's really important and, and that's one of the big tenets of our charter system work. Okay, if you'll go to the next one. I know we have board members here. I know we have College and Career Academy board members here. We are approved by the State Board of Education to give you training credit. So we're going to give you three hours of training credit. Now, the, this is not for SG, uh, LSGT members right now, because you all are not required to have a certain number of hours, but your board and your college and career academy boards are. So at the end of our session today, I'd like for you to go back in your next work session or in your next meeting and just talk about some of the ideas, some of the things you've learned today, and then um, Either uh, Chance or Marissa can send Pam Talmadge, who's our executive assistant, can send her the names of the board members who were here and their email addresses, and then she will issue you your three hours training credit. Okay? All right. Eric? Okay. To reiterate, uh, Lynn got us into the charter system status early in the game, so we were looking at each other in 2007, 2008, 2009, like, what are we supposed to be doing? What is our roles and responsibility? That is important, and also, what innovations and flexibility can we take advantage of? So part of what you're here today to do is to see your roles and responsibility, and, the, and even more exciting is, as Lynn mentioned, there's a plethora of opportunity on the website to look and see what other people have done and customize it to yourself, or either say, that's not for us. So right now, we're going to go over the agenda topics. What is a charter system? And how did Katusa school system become one? What is effective governance for charter systems? And what does it look like here? 
What is broad flexibility? We're going to hit that pretty hard. And how are you using this to maximize student success? And once again, we'll go to innovations and flexibility to maximize student success. And how are other charter systems using the broad flexibility? That's what we're talking about on the website, and we'll show you examples today. And what can the school governance team do to improve our school system? Okay, table talk. In what areas do you think your SGT could improve? Number two, in what areas do you think your SGT is strong? And what is one question about charter system you would like answered today? So just think about this. Take, take pause a second and read this and keep this in your mind as we go through. And, and I'll tell you what, why don't y'all take a few minutes and just talk at your tables and then we're just gonna kind of shout out and just sort of see where we are. Um, so just look at those three questions, think about them, talk at, with your teams, and then we're gonna just report out real quickly. Three minutes. Three minutes. I don't think this is the right PowerPoint, but we'll go with it. Whoops. Yeah, because we didn't have that. No, she didn't put the right one. Wait a minute, I'll tell you later. We'll just go with it. Yeah. <clears throat> How many, do we want to, how many do we want to report out? I just said five or six. Okay, unless I get they, it. Unless they really get going and they want to keep talking. Yeah. But not long. I can When you're doing something like this, I can enjoy it. Oh. <laughs> it's more like a competition. Yes. I like yes. that part. Well, let's do it. Eric. So this table's going first, right? Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. We're wondering if that's what the feedback is. We're guessing. Yeah. I think I got. Who do y'all play tonight? Okay. We play Westland. Okay. That's a good point. Good luck. You say Wesleyan? Okay. Yeah. 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 I've been there. It's got that turf field. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cool, y'all. Okay. Seriously. Perfect. Do we need more than two, do you think? I think so. I think that'd be fine. If y'all would just help us get it passed around, that'd be great. Okay. Okay. Y'all want to go second? Yeah. Okay, second. They're going first. They're going first, second. I'm going to get her to come over here. They're going to go first, they're going to go second, and then after that we'll just call, you know, on the volunteer basis. Okay. All right. 30 more seconds. 30 more seconds. All right. Thank you. You win prizes after this for volunteering to go first. Group one. Gosh. 
Okay, so at Boynton Elementary School, um, we are so blessed to have an incredible team of community members, parents, and teachers at our school. We feel like um, we've got some new people on the team, so they're just learning about what this team is all about. Um, we feel like this year for us that um, the school has always been very transparent in sharing with our local school governance team about um, our budget, um, what's happening in the school, different ways that they can give input. So we feel like this year we're even stronger in our open communication with each other. And it's not just about the principal, just um, giving out information per se to our local school governance team members, but them actually being active contributors to the to the team, and so we feel like that's our strength that we've got going on. As far as areas that we can improve is just making sure that we're being um, a little bit more transparent with our finances. Um, we have been giving like budget updates and those kind of things, but having them more involved in our financial decisions, and especially when it comes to our um, the curriculum and different things that we're doing there. And we did not have any questions. Excellent. Thank you. We've got another volunteer over there. Oh, oh you're the volunteer. Oh, yay. <laughs> <laughs> so for us, um, areas that we would like to improve, I think um, last year we spent a lot of time. Um, I had, you know, just the involvement with the team and the staff and the kids. We had, you know, we would have pre-K come sing a song so they could see the pre-K students. But this year, I think I want to just add maybe walkthroughs of the building, going into classrooms and letting them see something that we're doing that we're excited about. Um, and then also just the purpose with the staff of LSGT. I think I probably need to do a better job of communicating that and what we're doing and just being more open about that. Um, and then as far as what areas we think we're strong in, um, we feel like we have a very dedicated team and that our goal is to put our kids first and the things that we talk about are putting our students first and what's best for our students and our kids. And then as far as questions, honestly, this is my first in-person training, so we just had the videos. So I think probably the presentation and looking through the agenda is gonna answer a lot of what I have, um, but um, that's it really for us, so. We're looking for volunteers now. Does another table wish to volunteer yes. with, with some excellent advice? Eric, one thing that I would say is that I, Probably 20 years ago, we were all schools were required to have advisory boards. So maybe you guys were a principal here when we had advisory boards. And it was a sit and get. I would go, I would tell them the state of the school, they would go, and that was the end of that meeting, which was kind of a mandatory thing. It, it really is encouraging to see that we have now governance boards that are not only getting information, but they're giving some things that we need to do to, to make it so we're making more opportunity for our kids but and our community. So um, you guys have really come a long way just in the conversations I heard about your roles as people that are directly involved with what's happening in our schools and our community. So that's a, that's a big plus. Well, we have a great team and with new members coming on, you know, the new members learn as we go. Um, and we have several here that uh, were on it last year. And I think the two things that have really stood out is when we start talking about budgets, they were amazed at how we operate schools on the budgets that we have and what we do with what we have. And so that was eye opening to me that maybe I need to be better at communicating out to others about, you know, we're not loaded and we do the best what we can with what we've got. But something else we did last year is we have our intervention first thing in the morning and so our meetings are first thing in the morning. So I took the team out and we went to the different classrooms to show what we were doing with some of our money to, you know, get our kids, you know, up to date for those that are, that are slacking or those that just need the extra push or the ones that are advanced what they were doing. So, you know, bringing them in and able, them able to see what we're doing, I think was eye opening to me and to them, so. Just another example of operating at a higher level than this Paul's stated advisory board or committee. We got time for one or two more, please. Anybody? Let's go for one more then. And that's okay too. That's okay. Y'all are gonna be shy. 
Okay, one more right here. So, uh, one strength one strength that we have is we just have, you can see, we have a large group. So we have a lot of people that love Ringgold Elementary, are committed to seeing um, student success and making our school a better place. Um, some questions that we have and some areas that we want to grow, you've got a new principal, a new registrar, um, and we've got some... Uh, returning members to our team, but we have a lot of newbies. So we've got a lot to learn. Um, so we're interested to learn from you guys just about the structure and what an LSGT should really look like. And we're also eager to learn from our peers to see some things that they're doing to make their team successful. Very good. Very good. Excellent. Anybody else? If not, we'll continue. Just out of curiosity, how many of you are brand new school governance team members? We have a lot in the room. Yeah. And, and I think someone, I can't remember who it was, but someone had a really good point because this is the first time I've been back here in person in three years. I mean, that's a long time. And we, you know, I think it makes a big difference, video <laughs> versus being here in person and actually being able to talk about things and ask questions. So I really appreciate those questions. I, I'm so proud of y'all and I appreciate all the sharing that you've done and Eric, Let's talk to them about some of the things that they have questions about. Okay, so right here, you have a Board of Education that has a contract with the Department of Education, a contract that allows you the flexibility, the innovations in return for higher student achievement. Uh, you you're, you're, you're don't have to follow a lot of the rules, just put it like that. Uh, because it's good for kids. You're, you're not that bogged down in the bureaucracy as much. We'll give you examples later on. Um, you have the local school governance teams, and that's a requirement, and you get recertified every five years where you will see what your goals were and see how you've accomplished your goals. Okay. Okay, and, and, and one thing I, I missed, it was uh, the year 2007, and that was basically Senator Dan Weber, who's our boss, and Casey Cagle, Lieutenant Governor Casey Cagle, amongst many others that created it. And, uh, and it's intended to increase student achievement and with a focus on, this is not going to surprise you, economic development. Because what is education for? Uh, it's for a lot of things, and the holistic and such, but at the end of the day, we want everybody to go get a job. So we want you to be achieving at a higher level, and we're here to support that. We are here to support this. We're always an email and phone call away. What is not included, of course you knew this was coming, there are things that you still have to abide by. And I, I guarantee you, if everybody were to take a test on this, you would have guessed this. Uh, federal, state, and local laws, uh, civil rights, insurance, uh, safety is the big issue, um, pre prevention of unlawful conduct, in or near a public school, yeah, you have to deal with that, we all did. Reporting requirements, accountability, and EIP requirements and such, just to name a few. But that's a small percentage. You have a lot of flexibility. So you need to maximize, and that's what we're talking about. And we had a lot of good comments coming from the LSGTs about uh, their involvement with the, with the school that they are representing. And you have, as an LSGT, you have decision-making authority, but hold on to this now, because this next slide's gonna tell you something a little bit different. Personnel decisions, financial decisions, curriculum, instructions, resource allocation, monitoring achievement and school improvement plan. So as a LSGT member, you are involved in all that. You are needed, you're an advocate, you're a resource, you're extremely important. And you need to not just focus on your school in totality all the time, you need to look at this as a system as well. So we're all on the same bus, we're all, all on the same team. But there's a little bit of a but here. It makes it clear that at the end of the day, the Board of Ed has the final say. Okay, so uh, you're still under the control of the local school board of education. This means that although the superintendent and the board of ed give consideration to the recommendations input from the LSGT, and normally they do, at the end of the day, the ultimate authority still rests here. I think I'm at the right table. Okay, all right. But you are part of the team. You're influential. You're more on the micro level at each school as far as being a local school governance team. So you're the grassroots. You're, you're the, uh, where the rubber meets the road. Okay, when, um, 
Are you going to do it for me? I'll okay. just keep doing it. Okay, before we kind of move on to where your, your work lies, let's talk a little bit more about this flexibility thing that um, Eric just mentioned. All right, we have a set of laws in Georgia, and it's called Title 20. Um, it is huge. It is massive. There are a lot of things in there that are really outdated. But laws in Georgia that go into Title 20 get there a lot of the time because a legislator has a district where they had a problem, and they wanted a law passed that would solve their problem. So they get their legislator really, really busy and their legislative delegation get this law passed. Well, it may solve the problem for that school district, but guess what it did for a lot of other school districts? Created a problem. Well, you can only get laws out the way you get them in. So the only way that you can get a law out is the same way you got it in, which is like voting it out. Well, what happened prior to 2007 and those of us who were working in school districts prior to 2007 know this well. I'm probably the only one in here. But those who were working in school districts prior to 2007, if there was something in state law or something in a state board of education policy that was getting in the way of you educating your kids the way that you needed to, you could ask for permission to, have, to be excused from that but sometimes it would take as much as three months to get an answer back from the State Board of Education. For example, if you had a group of middle school kids and that group of middle school kids really needed some additional support in math and you had a great idea about how you could change your middle school schedule up and change up your teams in the middle school and provide some additional math services for these kids, you couldn't do it because the state law and the state board education rules say this is how you have to operate middle schools. And it didn't have a place in there for you to give math remediation. All right, so in 2007, when this law was passed, it opened up a huge, huge, huge door for those of us in education and for parents and for kids and for communities. However, there were only, to date, we only have 48 charter systems out of 180. Do you know why? What piece of charter system work would you think would create the reason or cause some concern with a, with a uh, school board or superintendents? Y'all are sitting in this room. Having parents, community members, and teachers come to the table and actually work with y'all to make decisions. And that's what we're gonna talk about in a few minutes. And I just want you to know, I commend Catoosa County and the other 47 districts we have. We are growing, we are growing, because charter systems, and through the Charter System Foundation, we're doing a lot of research, and we're doing a lot of data um, gathering and, and analysis. And one thing that we're seeing is our charter systems are outperforming in almost every single instance, the traditional school system. Because you're doing things that meet the needs of your kids. You're not doing things because a set of rules told you you had to do it that way, okay? So what we're gonna do right now is we're gonna talk a little bit about where your work lives, and then we're going to talk about Catoosa County specifically. And I'd love for, chance to jump in here because um, I want you to see what you all are doing here in Catoosa because I think you're doing it a, in a really, really good way. All right, all of, your char all of your school governance team or your local school governance team, and by the way, you're going to hear us kind of go interchangeably with these acronyms. Some districts call their school governance teams SGTs. Some of them call local school governance teams. Atlanta Public Schools calls theirs go teams. Some people call them councils. So, you know, whatever they're called, it's all the same thing. Okay, your work lives in the area of school improvement. You have management of your school, and that's your principal's job. You have management of your school system, and that's your superintendent's job. Your school board does not get involved in management day-to-day -day of your school system. 
School governance teams do not get involved in management day to day of your school. Um, school governance teams work lives in the area of school improvement and that's really really important to think about so what does that look like well first of all it looking at your school improvement plan understanding your school improvement plan and we'll talk in just a few minutes about some of the ways that you all are working with this is very very important because you have to know what your goals are you have to know what you're trying to get to and you have to know whether you're getting there um, looking at progress <clears throat> reviewing that progress is extremely important looking at how you are um, managing your school budget you all talked about school budget a little while ago are you prioritizing spending uh, to support that school improvement plan do you have enough spending going on to support those initiatives um, so there anything dealing with school improvement is where your work lies and so right now we're going to look at what y'all are doing here in Catoosa County okay um, if you'll click for me Okay, so here's what yours looks like, and I'm going to have to step over here, although I think this is my place. I can't go unless I get out of the live streaming. But um, you have seven to nine members on your school governance teams, and I really like that because it gives you a range. You don't have to have one or you don't have to have the other. And one reason that school districts don't want to get a whole bunch of people on their school governance teams is that you live by the open meetings and open records laws just like your Board of Education does. And so you have to have a quorum in order to have a meeting, and the more people you get involved, the harder it is to get that quorum. Also, sometimes the more people you get involved in this core group, the harder it is to come to some decisions. And that's why we really encourage school governance teams to have some committees and subcommittees. If you want to pull some other folks onto a subcommittee about something that you're looking at, a reading program or school uniforms or whatever it is, you can pull folks in your community onto that. But you have seven to nine members in your, um, for your, yours. You have a principal, and your principal is a non-voting member. Uh, you have two certified staff members. Okay, and, and what we're finding, that kind of goes across the board. Sometimes we have school governance teams that have one certified staff member and one non-certified staff member. And for those of you who don't know, certified usually means a teacher or a counselor. It's someone who has a teaching certificate. A non-certified is usually a pair pro, or uh, it could be, um, it could be a, um, sometimes, I'm trying to think of another non-certified. It could be a, um, someone who works in administrative work with your school. But you can, again, I think that's great given that school perspective. The law also requires you to involve teachers on there. You also have two parents who are not school employees. And I think that's super important because sometimes if you're wearing a teacher hat and, an, uh, and a parent hat, it's hard to separate the two. Remember? <laughs> it's really tough to do that. I was my daughter's high school um, assistant principal, and my husband and I had to have a lot of conversations about how to separate that. Like, I couldn't suspend her and send her home because she talked back to me. You know, so we had to, yeah, I did send her home for dress code one time because he said her shorts were not too short, and I said they were, and she went home as soon as we got to school. But, but, having said that, let me say this. It, having those parent members is so important because as educators, we don't often see things through the parent's eyes, even if we're parents. And you know, that's kind of crazy, isn't it? We're parents and we expect things to be done for our kids, but when we're doing it for other people's kids, sometimes we don't see it. So parents are super, super, super important. Business and community, wow. How our business and community leaders are so important to us because when we're looking at charter system work, we're not only looking at what's good for our kids, but we're also looking at what's good for our community. And I will tell you this right now, I do not have a child in Floyd County Schools. I don't have a grandchild in Floyd County Schools. I don't work for Floyd County Schools anymore. But I will tell you this, I want them producing the best plumbers the best electricians, the best future doctors, the best future nurses and teachers, because I want a good quality of living. And that's what makes it in your school district. And your school district 
your school community is only as strong as your educational community. So it's real important that we bring those community members in. And then you all, and I love this because not everybody does this, you have one or two student members who can be on your um, school governance team. And that really is impactful. I, if you're working, especially if you're working middle schoolers or high schoolers, they're going to tell you what they think. They don't care if you like it or not, but they're going to tell you what, you what they think. And I think it's becoming more and more elementary kids as well. And we don't often get that kid point of view. So I think it's really important that y'all are doing that, and I commend you on that. You do have staggered terms, you have some term limits, and you also don't want multiple family members to serve you know, on the same team, because it's kind of like you don't want a block vote kind of thing. Um, school governance teamwork is extremely, extremely, extremely important. And so the decisions you all make really impact the lives of the kids you have in your building. So if you'll go next, let's talk about what you're doing with, oh, let me talk about this first. Okay, you get additional funding in Catoosa County simply because you're a charter system, okay? Now, from the time you became a charter system to now, which was 2017 to 2023, this is how much money y'all have gotten. That's a chunk of money. And I'll tell you the good thing about that money is that you don't have a lot of strings tied to it. It comes to you from the state, which is very unusual that you don't have any strings tied to it, but it is to be used to support your school improvement planning, support your district strategic planning, help train your uh, school governance teams or your college and career academy board to do those things that you need to do to be a successful charter system. So if you'll go to the next one, I want to show you these next three, and I'm just going to have um, uh, Eric sort of pop through those. You have these on your handout. I asked Marissa to send me a list of kind of just a summary of how y'all had used your money, and I love it. I love it because you've done things like hire academic coaches, hire um, instructional coaches, build outdoor classrooms buy instructional materials, do professional development, um, do data walls, just all kinds of really, really, really good stuff. I love that I see a lot of it working toward have, helping your students and your faculty travel. We have a lot of things that kids do, uh, especially in some of their, um, their organizations that they have that require them to travel. And, that's not paid for, so this is a great way of allowing some kids who wouldn't have the opportunity to go and to be involved in some of these activities. Okay, Eric, okay, just, just flip on through. All right, so what we're gonna do now is talk about how you guys are making decisions, okay? And I'm gonna have to move right over here in order to do that. All right, so we're gonna take these five areas of decision making. One of them is personnel, one of them is budget, one is school improvement, one is curriculum and instruction, and the other one is school operations. And that's what the law says, that school governance teams have to have some sort of decision-making authority or some way of participating in decision-making. Okay, now here's the kicker, and this is important. This is the piece that got people all upset, gave them all kind of heartburn when you talked about charter systems because they thought the school governance teams were going to take over the world. They thought they were going to get the checkbook, they thought they were going to be hiring and firing, and that's not true. In a charter system, the authority that the school governance team has is determined by what you have in your contract. And your contract is developed by you. And it is a contract between your local board and the state board. So what you may do works great for you, but you might have a charter system someplace else that has a whole different way that their school governance teams are participating in decision making. And that is absolutely fine. As long as you have the minimum amount of authority and you do give your charter, I mean your school governance teams some way of participating in decisions in these areas, then you're following your contract and you're fine. I will tell you this. There are some things that um, 
charter, that, that school governance teams sometimes think they need to be involved in, like student discipline or like personnel issues, and they really do not need to be involved in those, and believe me, you don't want to be involved in those, no way. But you just think about what I'm about to tell you and how this sort of fits into the work you're doing now. Okay, when we talk about school uh, or school achievement goals, or we talk about that school, that, uh, school improvement plan. All right, so y'all are approving your school improvement plan, which I love. You know, you ought to be talking about your school improvement plan at every single school governance team meeting. Because by uh, talking about it, not only are you, have you approved it, but you're monitoring the progress of that plan. You know, as teachers and as principals and as uh, community members, how you're doing on your goals in literacy, how you're doing on your goals in math, how you're doing on your graduation rate. And if something you're doing is not working, then y'all are gonna be a part of figuring out what we need to do to fix this. So it's super important you talk about that at every single meeting. You have an LSG team member who serves on the school improvement team. I love that. We don't always have that happen, but I think when you have a, a school governance team member who's actually helping develop that plan and taking this information back to the team is powerful, very powerful. You all recommend the use of flexibility, and that's what we were talking about with this whole state law and state uh, board rule thing, but you recommend how your school can use flexibility to create some innovations that make things better for your kids. I mean, there are, there are a lot of different ways that you all can do that. One thing I do wanna to say to you about your uh, agenda and your school improvement plan, if you're not able to tie back every single agenda item that you have on your agenda every month, if you can't tie it back to your school, to your, uh, school improvement plan, you probably don't need to be talking about it. Because if you can't tie it back to school improvement, it's probably going over in management somewhere. And I always say school improve, or, or student, uh, I'm sorry, school governance teams are not in the business of figuring out why somebody didn't play Friday night. And they are not in the business about who got on homecoming court. And they are not in business about who got to be cheerleader. And that sometimes is where school governance teams get a little sideways and when that happens I'll very often have a superintendent call me and say can you come meet with a school governance team in my school district and I will and it's just kind of this misunderstanding of what their role is where did my clicker go got it oh, it's next slide are. oh you okay there we go personnel decisions the only the only decision y'all have to have any say so in whatsoever if according to law is who is the principal in case of a vacancy? <coughs> and that's because the principal is the person who's gonna be implementing this school improvement plan. Now, what you all do is that you actually help to interview your principal candidates, which I think is great. We have a lot of districts that, um, that don't actually have their school governance teams involved in that interview process. But I, I always did as a superintendent, I had some of my school governance members sit with us on an interview team, because I think it's important. We do have some school districts that have students sit on the interview team, and we have at least one school district I know of that their, their prospective principals have to go to a student interview team. They interview with a bunch of kids, and I have talked to these folks, and they say that's the hardest interview they ever had. I mean, hands down. You provide input into what requirements are for subs. I like that. I really like that. You know, substitutes, it's an interesting job. It's, they're hard to come by, number one. And number two, you don't want somebody who's just babysitting your kids. You need to have that instruction going on. So you all um, do provide input for that, and you make recommendations for staff positions, which I think is really good because one of the things I would do as a superintendent is I would give my allotment to my principals and if they decided they really didn't need that fourth grade teacher, but they really did need another first grade teacher, I'd say, fine, that's what you need, let's do it. And so being able to look at those allotments and look at that staffing is super important because that's a part of your school improvement plan, okay? All right, when you look at um, 
finances. You know, every school has a school budget. <clears throat> and the school budget has money coming in in a lot of ways and going out in a lot of ways. Now, sometimes you have money that kind of comes to your school because you have a grant. Or you have, some of your schools may get more federal money than other schools get because of their, um, their percentage of uh, students with disabilities or their percentage of students who are below the poverty level. But everybody, all schools get in some federal money, some state money, some local money that's generated from through these different sources. But financial decisions where y'all are concerned are those decisions that are going to support and finance your school improvement plan. Now, some of our school governance teams take a look at fundraisers. Um, what you all do is you do a lot of stuff. I would tell you that. You review your current school budget so you know what your budget is, and that is kind of a given. Everybody should be doing that. But then you also make, make recommendations during the school year. You do things like recommend the use of charter funds. That's what we just talked about a few minutes ago. Um, you approve your school budget for your supplemental funds. And so I think it's really important to look at the fact that you all are really cognizant about how much money there is and how little money there is. You know, a lot of folks out in the community think we have all the money in the world because they pay school taxes. Do you ever have? Yeah, all the money in the world. And oh my goodness, if the tax rate goes up a little bit, well, it's what are those people doing with all my money? Well, it's a good thing for you as school governance team members to let them know what's going on with their money. I mean, it is super, super important. I, I, I will tell you, my grandchild goes to a private school. She goes because it's a faith-based school and her parents wanted her raised in a faith-based school, and that is their prerogative. But I tell my son-in-law all the time, did you go to the doctor? Or when he fusses about school taxes, I said, did you go to the doctor? Have you, have you had your car work done? Um, did you go to the dentist yesterday? And he shuts up real fast. Because we have to support our public education, right? It's a very important thing. Okay. And then when we look at curriculum instruction, you all are not curriculum specialists. You have people in your building who are specialists in music, art, uh, math, science, language, social studies, but you all need to know what is happening in those classrooms. You don't necessarily have to sit in that classroom or need to sit in that classroom, but you need to know what kind of curriculum are we using? How do we decide to use that? We have a big push on literacy right now especially in grades K through three. It's real important for y'all to know, what are you doing? What kinds of programs are you using? And are they working? And that is super important, okay? And then school operations is the last area. And school operations is enormous. It is absolutely huge. And it has everything from transportation to student discipline to dress code to all kinds of things. But what I love about what y'all are doing is you've taken a lot of different areas that deal with school operations and you've really tied those back to how do these things impact student achievement. You don't think about operations doing that very much, but your bail schedule, having time in your bail schedule for remediation or for enrichment, and that's super important. Uh, dress code. If you live in, I know we work with some districts that there is a real distinction between the have and the have nots in the school. So when it comes down to, you know, you wear a pair of jeans and you wear a certain color top and that's your dress code. And it sort of cuts out this, I'm wearing a designer thing today and you're not and you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, I love the idea that you're looking at stakeholder surveys. Well, you better be finding out what your stakeholders think because if you don't find out, they'll put it on Facebook. I promise you, they would definitely put it on Facebook. Developing these communication strategies between home and school. I don't know of anything more important than the communication. So you are doing a great job on the operations piece. Okay, Eric. All right, you also have something in place that not a lot of charter systems have, but I love this. And I think you have it because you're a bigger charter system. And with, with how many schools, 17, 19, 18 schools, 
I know I had 21 schools, and it was hard for me to get around to see everybody. So I, I did, but it, I couldn't do it in all one day. So what you have in your district is something that you call an ACE team, and I'm sorry that doesn't show it real well in white, but you call it an ACE team, and it's a representation of each of your school governance teams. And they come and meet with your superintendent on a regular basis during the year, and that way he can keep sort of his thumb on the, you know, kind of on the pulse of knowing what's going on. And I'll tell you, I did that in my district because I had a big district, and it was wonderful for us to know what each other was doing and for me to get feedback from them because I didn't always hear the things in the community that they heard. Okay, Eric? All right, you also have bylaws. Super, 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 super important. If you have not looked over your bylaws as a team, if you have not taken some of your meeting time and really gone through those bylaws, I highly, highly urge you to do that because your bylaws basically is your operating manual. You all have one set of bylaws for the whole system, which I think is great, and that way when you have um, students who move from one school to another school, their parents aren't all confused about getting used to a whole different way something's happening. But your bylaws do more than that. It has in there your code of conduct for y'all, for, for the members. It has in there um, the roles and responsibilities of your school governance team, how you elect officers, how you're gonna deal with committees if you decide to have committees. Um, your superintendent and your board at any time can review these and uh, it's recommended they, that they review them annually just like you do. But it sort of gives you your outline for how you operate. And again, put that on your checklist. If you haven't looked over those, be sure that you're looking over those. So right now on your checklist you have be sure you know what's in your bylaws, be sure that you know what's in your school improvement plan, and look at those agenda items every month based on what you have in that school improvement plan. Okay? All right, Eric? All right, Eric, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay, thank you. None of this should surprise you. Uh, involved with any organization, you need a code of ethics. You must, and it's up at the top for a reason, respect the chain of command. Very important, I know everybody understands this, and I don't mean to be talking down to anybody. This is something we just need to cover. Uh, do not provide directions to the staff or influence staff decisions unless you are involved, as Lynn has already laid out, what involvement you're at and what involvement you're not at. Uh, represent all students, not just a select group. Be informed about matters. Focus on facts related to student achievement. And Lynn's very much already covered every bit of that. Uh, participate in training and attend meetings. And uh, there, you know, if, you, if you're not showing up to meetings, at some point you need to self-realize and say, I just can't do this, okay? My, my schedule's too busy. So you need to be involved. Work with each other. I, see a, I just feel a lot of energy in this room. And you, everybody's on the same team, I really do. Speak with one voice when it's over. You have a meeting, you have differences of opinions. That's great, that's wonderful. But you gotta come out with one voice. And the individual school governance team members have no authority at a certain level, but they have influence beyond just lots of influence and support. You're the advocate for that school. You are involved. And of course, the mandatory child abuse reporter. Okay, let me just step right here. Charter system school governance structure can make recommendations to the superintendents participates in school improvement, the decision-making process, as I just indicated, advocates and supports the work of the teachers and principals, provides varied perspectives. That's very important. You can bring a different mentality to the equation, to the conversation, when sometimes in any vocation, you get some tunnel vision. So you are there to add a new idea that hasn't been thought of. Um, the local board of education, the uh, process right there, you understand that, superintendent, who reports to whom and such, and determines the district budget, approves budget, develops district budget, selects. These are more in the land of the local board of education, develops school budgets, but you're at the table. You, you get involvement, you get input, uh, and instructs and supports students. So this is really restating in a different PowerPoint slide what Lynn has been indicating. All right, switch gears. Pause a second and look at the, look at the uh, chart right there. State of Georgia. This is a list of the charter systems. I just 
thought you needed to see this. Uh, yes, there's more in North Georgia because we're smarter than South Georgia. <laughs> no, my dad's from uh, Claxton, so I, I'm, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. It's just naturally it developed that uh, it came out of Atlanta and proceeded from there. Uh, I want to point out one. Uh, wait a minute, I'm going to come back to Chattahoochee in a second. So being a charter system evidently must make a difference because, Lynn, please correct me. I may not get this right. There's four finalists for the uh, superintendent of the year. Three of them are from charter systems. Must be something to it. And uh, just recently at the uh, Charter System Foundation conference, uh, Dublin was named Superintendent of the Year and Lumpkin County was named Su System of the Year for the Charter System Foundation. So uh, now let's go back to Chattahoochee. Fort Benning, I forgot what it's called now, but Fort Benning is there. Talk about rural low economic status, AKA poor, transient students come and go all the time. And they're achieving at a high level because the superintendent down there is really maximizing, along with the staff and LSGTs and such, the flexibility. Uh, so how do you ever get anybody caught up because you don't know what they've taken? Well, for example, you have the Charter System Foundation flexibility to allow them to take a competency, competency test. They waive uh, seat time, they waive uh, 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 day, school days, and the list goes on. So I just want to highlight them real quickly. I mean, if this county can do it with all the challenges they have, anybody can do it. Yes. All right, for the sake of time, we are not going to do a planned break because it's, it'll take more time to take a break and get it right back in. So in order for y'all to, to be able to go home a little bit early, we're not going to take a planned break, but if you need to slip out, it's fine. You, you don't bother us, okay? Yep. Okay, so Paul's going to help me out on this one. The, the charter system is a school system approach, and we're going to talk a little bit about the College and Career Academy and economic development. So I, I'm interested in kind of thinking about why did we start off with charter system? Why did it even become a possibility? And I'll tell you the reason. The reason is because we know that local communities can make decisions that best serve not only their students, but also their businesses and their industry and their parents. And so you're different from some, a lot of those other districts that you saw in there, but you know that difference and you know what it is in your community that you want to grow. And part of that flexibility is, is that you can actually start new programs. And so many of the charter systems have started college and career academies. A college career academy, this is a unique difference. A college career academy is not a separate school. It is a program of your existing schools. And what that, why that's important is, is because it's not standalone. It actually is all those students that attend the from here to career, those are our students, okay? They're coming from your base high schools and attending that school. So these are still our students. And so that makes it really essential that there's a communication between here to career and their, their high school feeders and middle schools and elementary schools. So that communication is going through. How many of you here uh, own a business and are looking to, you know, having challenges at all in hiring folks, finding the right qualified, highly qualified? Anybody in here? We hear that across the state. And so one of the ways that we can continue to develop young folks and get them prepared for careers is through a college career academy. There are a lot of ways to get there, but that's one way to do that. There's an emphasis on getting from where they are to their career and doing it at a younger age and well prepared. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about some things that they're already doing here to help those students get well prepared. But you can see if you look at some of the goals and missions, it's really for those students who have a clear focus, uh, usually at a younger age, about what they want to do uh, post high school. And so we can help them get there to, the due, to, to get there to that point. So I applaud that you guys have had that in place and a great facility. How many have toured this facility? How many here have already toured this facility? One of the biggest challenges that all college and career academies has, have is getting the information out to not only the schools, but the community. If you haven't done so and you're at an elementary school or you're at a middle school or a high school, it's a great place to come and tour and to visit and to see what kind of opportunities students have and they do it at a younger and earlier age. So I uh, encourage you to do that. If you're not um, with, at a school and you're a, in the community, set up a time with 
you know, Mark, uh, Marissa, just kind of get set up a time. I'd be happy to give you a tour, so that'd be a great idea. The, um, also, at each of your school, elementary, middle, high, need to be ingrained to a certain extent with what's happening at the College and Career Academy. Once again, to reinforce tours on all levels and such, because this is an innovative practice within the charter system. Also, the College and Career Academy has a certification process that they go through every five years that goes through the TCSG and the DOE. And also one commercial for the Charter System Foundation, education is full of silos. You got the, you got the DOE, you got TCSG, you got the Charter System Foundation, it goes on and on. The fact that Paul and I, and, uh, Paul's working with Len and I, is another indication we're breaking down the silos. And uh, it's been very interesting, and this was, uh, the, Dan Weber led the charge on that. I'm going to be very brief on the technical thing, side here. So for every five years, a school system, or a specifically a college career academy, has to go through four certifications. Guess what? A lot of it is the same thing. So we got everybody in the room to discuss what is the same, what can we eliminate, and how can we make it easier? And I know Mark would really appreciate that. Uh, he understands what I'm saying on the technical side on that. So that's just something that's been happening recently over the past year. Okay, so get this. One, two, seven. That's 10. Back in 1950, you needed one individual to graduate as a doctor, a lawyer, a PhD, et cetera, et cetera. You needed two to graduate with a four-year degree. That could be a teacher. You needed seven to graduate with post-secondary credentials, AKA an engineering technician, uh, a welder, uh, uh, a medical person and such. That ratio still exists today. And what I'm talking about, and I like, this is kind of corny, but if you were to close your eyes and it's 1905, think of trains, planes, automobile, education, three of them changed drastically. One did not. We've been doing education the same way we've been doing it for so long. But you're not because you're a charter system. You are not in that category. So you have the flexibility to be in innovative to help student achievement and local economic development. So let me ask this question uh, before we look at that. What is the graduation rate? Overall, state of Georgia, graduation rate for colleges? 33%. Okay, and we're geared to send everybody to college? I went recently to uh, two Fridays ago to the Atlanta Chamber, downtown Atlanta, found a parking place, thank goodness. And uh, I, I, there was the consulate, a really important individual from Belgium, Switzerland, and a couple others. And here's what he said when asked the question. I just wanted to read this. Um, he was there to present on internships, apprenticeships rather, apprenticeships. You know they have a different model in Europe, correct? And he, when commented, someone asked him, what do you think about America's response to apprenticeships? He said that he views America as pathologically addicted to four years of college. There is more out there than college. So that's part of the mission of the College of Career Academy is to get people career and, and, and college ready. And college does include the technical college. So if you have 100 students in Georgia, 83 graduate. 83 graduate. This is the average, this isn't you guys or anybody else. Of that, 60% go to post-secondary, so that's 50. And then 30% of those who attend complete college, so that's 36%. S only 7% are going to the technical college. That's an underused resource. And Paul spoke earlier about dual enrollment, and I left that off the list earlier, uh, dual enrollment, the opportunities. There's been a lot of push from TCSG and the Charter System Foundation to get the appropriate funding. And I'm not gonna get into the weeds on this one, but once upon a time, so much dual enrollment. It wasn't sustainable, we knew it. So they changed the rules and it got back down. But then there was a problem. Everybody was thinking they're going to college, so they took all academic dual enrollment and they forgot about the technical college, like the engineering, like healthcare science, uh, like law enforcement, et cetera, et cetera. So we all were able to work with the legislators as part of what we do as well to get additional funding. We'll just end it at that. So that problem only existed a year or two. Okay, the reason we need to get more people into the technical colleges is the workforce needs them and they need to be employed. If we don't have, if we continue to do school as we always have done, we're gonna leave a lot of people behind. And everybody in here knows this. 
if you are low income, neither of your parents went to school, uh, early childbirth, and your own public assistance, if you can't find your niche, whatever that niche may be, maybe drama, maybe art, it could be a technical competency, a career pathway, you're going to be left behind. And what happens then? Then their life is not good, and that's, that's not good, but they become a ward of society and, and, and such and so on. So we need to concentrate on SAT scores, AP classes, but we also need to concentrate on career pathways because that's where they find their difference. And Paul can echo this. So at the College of Career Academy, there are many kids who would have dropped out if they weren't attending because finally they never got recognized. They were never had, had something they loved to do and enjoyed. And I'll, I'll give you this one instance right here. There was a guy, he was in welding, and he was in the, um, we'll talk a little bit about this in a little while. He, he was in the alter. That's, ooh, that was the wrong word right there. He was in uh, the, uh, it was Senate Bill 2, became Option B, and then it became the uh, Accelerated Career Pathway. He was taking welding, and, he, and he, he was taking nine classes at the high school and working on certifications through the technical college so he could get a diploma, uh, a certificate diploma, or an associate's degree. So when we took him to, I'm just giving you an illustration of the Accelerated Career Pathway and an individual. He was smart. He wanted to do work, and he was a great welder. So I would take these children to, or these students rather, to speak at Rotary, civic clubs like that. And so he'd never spoken in his life, but he's passionate about what he was doing. And he was so proud to be in an accelerated career pathway. Here's how he ended his speech. He said, I appreciate this opportunity. I now enjoy school. I'm going to be successful. And you know what I like about accelerated career pathway the best? Ain't no Brit lit in career, accelerated career pathway. <laughs> I like Brit Lit. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not downing that. Yes, please. Uh, one of the challenges that we have with technical diplomas, degrees, is that there's a perception that's for those who can. And I can give you story after story about students who have gone into careers early while in high school and graduated. Just one. Thank you, Paul. So this is a chart. You already know the need. The employers are searching for employee, employers are searching for employees. We're overproducing. The second with the bachelor's degree, that may mislead you a little bit, but that's healthcare workers. There's a dr dramatic shortage of healthcare workers. And then let's concentrate on associate's degree. Look at the large gap right there. We're not having enough students go into the career pathways and go to the technical college where they walk out with little to no zero debt and they're making more than a starting teacher. That's the way I'd always present it to, to, to the teachers. These people can go through there, come out with no debt, and they're making more than a teacher. Now, teachers need to be paid more. Okay, I don't, 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 don't take me on that one. All right, here's just an illustration. Hopefully you can see it on your uh, handout right there. Of, um, if you go to the technical college, you go to four-year college, and you go employed directly from high school, you're actually, on average, going to make more money coming out of the uh, technical college route. And I didn't write this, but I'm going to read it. There's no demand for anthropology, sociology, psychology, music appreciation, art history, not offending anyone, please. There's a need for all of that, just not so many, just not so many. I mean, I personally have friends, highly educated, they're 
Kids would go to Auburn, Alabama, Ole Miss. They'd come back, couldn't get the job because they had a major that didn't fit anywhere in the real world, and they had to go back to the technical college numerous times, and these are my friends. This is the fun part. Okay, so I'm on now. All right, so um, well, I heard, we heard something while we were at the conference this weekend, and I just loved it, and I'm going to always remember this. We had a superintendent who said, it's important to know your work needs to be data-driven and not drama-driven. Think about that for a minute. Data-driven, not drama-driven. Too often what happens is our situation presents itself and then what do we do? We just get all crazy, right? And we start coming up with all this stuff. Well, what we're going to do real quickly is we're going to show you what some districts across the state that are charter systems and some college and career academies, what they've done using data that helped them to solve a challenge that could have turned into a great big drama, okay? So um, this, the first one is Baldwin County. All right, do you know where Baldwin is? Poverty area, um, and a lot of their kids just really don't have much at all, just really don't have much at all. Um, so what they had, they, they've done a lot of great things down there, but one of the things that I think is the most unique is that they had a group of elementary kids that I don't care what they did, nothing was working with them. Absolutely nothing was working with them. They were, attendance was horrible. I mean, just nothing was working. The kids were just not getting it. So that was their challenge. They were gonna lose this big chunk of little first, second grade kids if they didn't do something. Cause this kid, these kids would come on up and become dropouts, right? We know what happens. You don't drop out when you're 16, you start dropping out when you're about eight, okay? So what they did is they used their data and they partnered with Georgia College, which is in their community, and they said, what can we do? We have a big old problem here. So they started looking at different programs, different options for educating elementary kids, and they hit on Montessori. Do you know what Montessori is? Okay, Montessori, you may have a Montessori school here, I don't know. But Montessori is a routine, generally a public education program. It was developed by Maria Montessori, I don't know, way back, way back when. But the Montessori program is about as opposite from traditional public education as you can ever get. It is very student driven, it is multi-age, so you might have first, second, and third in a class together. It is driven by a great deal by student interest. It is um, kind of on the kid's own pace, um, but it's a very student-driven kind of program. So they decided, you know what? We've looked at our data. We know who our kids are. Let's talk to our parents. Let's see what our parents of these kids think. Let's give this a try. They also talked with the Montessori um, program in Georgia, and they said, we would like to do this in our public school. And the Montessori office in Georgia said, fine, we'll work with you. So what they ended up doing is they started out in a first grade classroom with just a few kids. They, um, it was a program of choice. Parents did not have to send their kids there. And they had teachers who were willing to come into this and teach, and they trained them in the Montessori method. All right, so from that, they got great success. I'm talking about data, man, they were like collecting data, going and coming, looking at the progress of these kids and these kids were flourishing. Well, at the end of the year, the parents said, we want this next year for second grade. And a bunch of other parents said, we have first graders coming up, we want this. Long story short, it's gone up into fifth grade now and it has been the biggest success anybody could ever imagine. And they are only one of five districts in the state that have a public Montessori program. And it is totally amazing when you look at the results that they have achieved from that. And that came out of being data-driven and not drama-driven. All right, so we're gonna give you, again, just a handful of things. Eric and Paula are gonna share with you. Some are elementary, some are middle, well, that's the elementary. Some are middle, some are high, some are college and career academy. And then um, Chance is gonna pick up after us, and he's going to tell you what you all are doing right here in Catoosa County. Uh-oh. Okay. 
So when I first started teaching, this isn't his name, but I had a student named Joe. And finally I went to the special ed director and said, is Joe special ed? And they said, no, he's not at all. He has no IEP or anything like this. He said, he just got started late. He lived in a house, in a trailer, that the parent never paid Joe any attention. He didn't know his colors, he didn't know his uh, ABCs, he knew nothing when he arrived at school, so he's always behind. So Calhoun was facing situations like this. And so they used their high school teaching as a profession, technically what it's called, teacher academy is what I called it, and they used the charter funding to have a Jack Jackson mobile learning lab. And what they did is they went out and visited at home sites starting from six months to four years old to catch up that gap that Joe had to face. And so that is, a, that, that is an innovative feature. Instead of just being in the teacher academy, teaching the professor, profession classroom and then doing internships at the other you know, elementary and middle schools, they went out and above and beyond. I thought that was a really cool, innovative practice. off okay they they use the summer feeding program they use their bus to help them do the summer feeding program so not only are they giving the kids nourishment for their bodies but they're also providing them instruction at the same time um, okay so Dublin City Schools Dublin is down in on 16 and I love what Dublin's done they've sort of taken a birth to college and career approach with their kids. They have what they call their baby Irish, which is a lot like the program we just talked about um, for their, their younger preschool kids. They have a daycare that they use that for their um, city employees and for their school system employees and their college and career academy kids who are in early childhood pathways work in that daycare. That's their, their work-based learning. In the middle school, they have created a gifted academy. They took an old high school, and again, this is a program of choice for parents. Um, all of their gifted kids, they, first of all, they knew they had more gifted kids than what was showing up in, in what they were testing. So they actually did more and more and more gifted testing to see who qualified according to state requirements. And then they worked with teachers to see which kids were really, um, motivated and maybe didn't meet that quite meet that criteria the state set so they just waived all that stuff and they created a gifted academy and it's in one of their old or it's in their old high school but they believe kids aren't gifted two periods a day two days a week they believe kids are gifted all day so they gave parents the choice of letting their kids come all of all of the day or part of the day to the gifted academy and it's worked absolutely beautifully Okay, I'm going to be talking locally here because this is where I worked and, and such. Um, all College and Career Academy boards, CEOs will face this at some point. You're sitting in a board meeting and you have multiple requests. We need this pathway. It would be great to have this pathway. Makes sense. Like if you didn't have an HVAC pathway, you probably need an HVAC pathway. But my response to that would be, well, I can't take, you know, 15 kids and put it in, in this classroom and you know, 12 kids in that and hire another teacher and then all the expense. So you have the flexibility. Let's say you've got um, a construction class, a welding class, an ag class or such, and they have standards to teach, but you are flexible. So what we did with HVAC, the response to the request for HVAC program was to embed it in current programs, specifically on the HVAC into construction. So we called some uh, HVAC companies in, we said, y'all are bidding against each other. You need employees, right? And they said, oh, absolutely, we need employees. I said, well, somebody donate us some equipment. Somebody give us some, um, one of your employees to come over and teach modules. I don't know how long that is. Is it two days? Is it three weeks? But we need some level of knowledge of HVAC to allow our students, when it's a mutual interest between them and the company, to have work-based learning opportunities. So we, that, that, that's a feeder pipeline. You don't have to create a different pathway for everything. You can embed things. Same thing with forklift. We've got Lowe's Distribution Center. 
huge. They called me up and said, hey, I need forklift drivers. Can you start a pathway? I said, no, I can't start a pathway. But can you give us a couple forklifts? We'll get the teachers certified across the street to the technical college. We'll embed that, and you get what you were really wanting. So you can be flexible. Also, um, are you all aware of this? you got to be careful when you do this, and you need to do this right if you choose to do something like this. But in engineering class, you think engineering, the career technical pathway, engineering specifically with us was uh, dual enrollment and such, but it doesn't have to be. And there's a lot of math, right? Well, you have the ability to teach math in there as well and have one class and get two credits. Okay, one class, you get two credits. Do it with fidelity, though. And you also free up time for more enrichment opportunities with respect to apprenticeship or work-based learning. So you have the ability to do that, but you need to do it right if you do such. Um, let's see. Oh. Yes, I knew I forgot something. Um, let's just stay on engineering, but you can say healthcare as well. We would bring in Georgia Power, Oglethorpe Power, Sooner Manufacturing, F&P Industries, Profile Extrusion to look at our curriculum. Let's just make up a number. I'm going to make up a number at 100. DOE standards. So there'd be 100 standards. And they would look at it, and they would send their engineers over and look at it for a couple days. They would spend two to three days. Look at it, and they say, look, 50 of these things, we haven't done this in 10 years. But these 50 are what we really are concentrating on. And also, this is what we're teaching these days. I actually had a physical example one day of a board member charged a Rocky Mountain uh, project. And he goes down to see the engineering lab where we bought some new equipment. And we have old equipment sitting out of the room. And we're going to get rid of it because this was in the early stages. Just didn't think we were supposed to be using that. But how the world did we know? How in the world did we know? And he says, what's this equipment doing sitting outside the uh, room? I said, I think we're going to throw this away. He said, no, that's what we use. I said, hold the door for me while I push it back in. So my response, to my, my, my statement is, get your business and industry to be involved with your curriculum delivery because only they truly know. Only they truly know. Okay, so this has been replicated a few times. So you've got a really great healthcare science program here at the uh, College of Career Academy. I toured it and it got some really neat equipment. There were some grants that really provided for super duper equipment. So Gordon County opened up a healthcare clinic using their healthcare science students to be partnered with a local hospital to provide clinic services like a CVS doc in the box for employees, for students, and um, it worked very well. So that gives them real life experience. And also, this is just a side note, doesn't really belong on this slide, but thinking about the pathway healthcare, let me, let me talk about that a second. We were able to have 300 students in the healthcare pathway. Of that, probably 60 to 80 each year were in healthcare pathways, internships, open heart surgery, emergency room, front, front office medical, back office, physical therapy, fire department, and things like this. The mission at that point was to walk around the senior year of a career pathway and hope that there was no students in that, in that class. And sometimes they'd come to me and say, well, hey, am I gonna lose my job? No, no, we're getting FTE on this, we're getting, it's okay. Put as many students as you possibly can in the real world through work-based learning at your high schools, College Career Academy, all of it, because the high schools and the College Career Academy must work together. If, if you have a College Career Academy, you've got to be flexible. You have to work with the high schools and vice versa. So uh, a clinic that benefited everybody, really, especially the students. Is this mine or yours? I don't remember this one. This one. Uh, yeah, do one more. Just real quickly, I want you to challenge your team to be thinking about what are we doing, if it's elementary, middle, high school, what are we doing to prepare students for after high school? What are we doing to prepare students for college and career? And I, it doesn't matter where that starts. Are we helping our students uh, kind of have some exploration? Are we having them do some type of um, work with social emotional? What are we doing to prepare them for what happens after high school? Uh, and so I think that this is going to be a great example. And I, what I like about giving these examples, I love big, audacious goals. 
And if you don't know what you don't know, then you don't even know what is possible. And so we share these examples, not because to say, hey, look what they're doing. It's about, hey, is there something here that resonates with you that maybe you would like to try to, to try to have an initiative for? And here in Daugherty County, they actually have developed very clear pathways from middle school through high school and into the workforce in the area of healthcare. And every pathway that they offer, if you go to the next slide, I think that's one more. Yeah, yeah right here. Every pathway they offer, by the time they get in high school, they already know that they want to be in that healthcare pathway. And they partnered with Phoebe Putnam, a, a local uh, healthcare organization. And it's not just partnered. These folks at Phoebe Putnam are also giving opportunities for internships, but also they're paying the employees when they come there. These students are earning money while they're in high school to be pursuing their career. But if you kind of look, in ninth and 10th grade, they already know that they're gonna be taking those intro level courses. But by the 11th grade, they're taking a course that's gonna have some type of a meaningful credential with that. And then that gets them prepared when they get ready to go to 12th grade, they can already go into some type of an internship. So if you know, if you have a student or if you have anybody that work for you, some of the best, tra the best training is actually on the job. And if you can pair that with a good mentor, I mean, that can just elevate what students are able to do. And that is really what we should be thinking about all the way down in kindergarten. How are we going to get them there? Okay, where along the way are they going to make that choice? I know we're not running out of time. I want to give you one quick story. As a high school principal, I often would walk into our senior classrooms spring semester, and I'd look around the classroom and I'd say, "What are you going to do after you graduate?" What do you think the number one answer was? What's that? I don't know. That's probably number two. I don't know. But number one, anybody have another guess? We're about our high school principals. What, are they, what, are they, what would they say? Where are they going to go after high school? College. They'd all tell me college. And I'd say, oh, that's great. I'd say, okay, well, have you taken the SAT, ACT? No. Have you applied to college? No. What college are you going to go to? University of Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We can't let that happen. We have to have our students on a career path way before their spring semester of their senior year. And I think that's exactly what you all are doing. I think that's what we're doing through all the different programs. I just want to say, Paul and I have sat in this class, and we're going to be quick on this. We give you shout outs about this across the state. Uh, this this uh, class that is, you know, youth science, uh, habitudes, and what I really like about this class is it's orienting, orienting them to the future, and you guys don't just do it in the ninth grade, you're tracking them through the twelfth grade. So this is a wonderful program. Yeah, and I do want, this is a great example of flexibility and kind of seeing that there's a need. So if you hire folks, or if you work for a company that does hire folks, and we ask you what is it that is valuable to you, okay, we might get some technical answers, but typically we're gonna get attitudes and behaviors. That's what we're gonna get. We want students that come to us, we can train them in the technical things, but how do they come to us with attitude and work skills and those, we call them employability skills, soft skills, maybe you call them. Well, I applaud what you've done here at this school uh, to be able to make it so every student goes through a, a course that's actually locally developed, locally funded, uh, that focuses on, um, to ex they call it magic, okay? Message awareness, acceptance, gaining respect, integrity, commitment. Now imagine if you hired every employee and they had those traits. That would be, take us a long way in this community. So I applaud you for doing that and your innovation. And I want you to know, we talk about this program that's going on in Catoosa. We talk about this all over the state of Georgia. So folks all over Georgia know what you're doing here. And they are blown away. So again, congratulations. Okay, you want to go back? Let me talk about their contract for a second. Um, okay, so before we turn everything over to your superintendent, I do want to talk to you for just a minute about the contract that you all have with the State Board of Education right now, it is good until 2027. So in 2026, I'll be working with y'all and we will start looking at what have you done over the last five years and what do you want to do in the next coming year, the next, next five years. And so that is a very important 
thing for y'all to be thinking about right now. So I asked Chance if he would talk with you about what you have in that contract. And then we're going to ask you to do a little bit of work at your tables. Uh, we may go a little bit over 11 o'clock, not much, but I do want you to kind of get started thinking about what challenges you have and how you can address those. So Chance, can we turn it over to you, please? Yes, ma'am. All right, guys, uh, everybody stand I up. I need to, do you want this? Stand up, everybody stand up. Wiggle, I'm the teacher, I don't like the answer. Hey, stretch around a little bit, okay? Go ahead and do that. Okay. Test, test, test. Keep doing it. You're not moving. I see you. Wrong chair. Oh, thank you. Where'd I leave it? Keep doing it. Keep doing it. Here's what I do in the classroom whenever I need to stand up. I say, look at your neighbor, guys, and tell them something you have learned so far. Go ahead and do it right now. Your elbow partner. Look at your elbow partner. Tell them something new that you learned today. Marissa Brower, if you're here, come up, please. We're very fortunate. She just handed me my car keys, which dropped out in the parking lot. I've never done that. Marissa Brower, if you are in this building, I need you now. Lord. All right, and just like that, we're going to stop and I'm going to put somebody on the spot. Tell me something that you learned new today at this table. Somebody. Oh, no, no, don't um, We learned that we want to share our meeting minutes and what we do in our meetings to the rest of our faculty. We want to have like a um, LSG team minute in our monthly faculty meeting. That's what we're doing. Hey, I love that. You know what? I do that too. Every single time we have a principal meeting, Peggy, my assistant, you can sit down now. Peggy, my assistant, sends out what we did in our principal meeting. Good. Because you know why? It's important. And I want our assistant principals and our teachers to know what we talked about. Because that's how we communicate and keep people in the know. All right, very good. So, a couple things I want to start with. Number one. I asked this old principal this. He's not, not, not around anymore. When I was an SRO, I said, uh, what in your entire, he was old then. I think he was born old. He was old. And I said, I was a school resource officer, and I would eat lunch with him sometimes. I said, in all your years in education, what is the number one thing that makes a difference in a kid being successful or unsuccessful? He didn't bat an eye. He said, that's easy. Parental involvement. It's more important than budgets. It's more important than principals. It's more important than superintendents. It's more important than teachers. Guys, we have some great teachers in this county. We got some kids that are not getting it. And you know why? Because they do not have parental support. Period. And it trumps it every single time. How many of you in here are parents again? Raise your hand. Yeah. Most important job in the world. You being here tells me and everybody else in this room, and more importantly, your child, I care how you do in school. For that, I thank you, thank you, thank you. Now, a couple things I want to talk to you about. And I like to sit, guys, because I'm old and I'm tired. And I love to sit. It just helps me. I feel better when I'm doing it. They say sitting is the new smoking. I try not to do it, but I just love it. <laughs> not smoke. Sit. <laughs> All right, so a couple things I want to talk to you about before, before I hand this back over to uh, uh, Dr. Plunkett. The hardest thing you're going to find as an LSGT member is to stay in your lane. I deal with that all the time as a superintendent. This person's getting out of their lane. I deal with it with me because I say, well, I don't have a lane. <laughs> I'm a superintendent. I can cross the lines. I got a police car. I just turn the lights on and move. That is, I have had to learn that my desire to help 
honestly gets in the way sometimes because it comes from a good place. A parent's in trouble. Let me swoop down into the school and fix it. That's not my job. My job is to say, have you talked to the, they, they, they emailed me. I know you guys are going to be surprised, but people email the superintendent and they say, superintendent, I'm having a problem with my kid's teacher and I need you to fix it. Now, I want to help, right? I was a police officer. I'm used to running to where the problem is. That's the worst thing I can do. The first thing and the best thing I should do is what? Have you talked to your teacher about that? Have you talked to your kid's teacher? It gives her or him the opportunity to deal with a problem. And 99% of the time, it's solved right there. I just can't get them to talk. If I can do that, it works. Number two, if that doesn't work, did you go to your principal? Number three, let's have a meeting at the county office. Number four, let's meet in my office. And then finally, if none of those things fix it, you can talk to my bosses. It's hard for me to stay in my lane. It comes from a good place. It's not a power trip. I don't care about it. I don't want it. It's a headache. It comes from a good place. And you are going to have things that come from good places, great ideas. But in order for your LSGT to function properly, you must do what nobody in government can do, and that is compromise. It's the hardest thing in the world. It's why we can't stay married. I've been married for 30 years, and you know how? My wife is always what? Men? Right. You're right, baby. I know. I'm sorry. I, I got out of my lane. It's, you, you got the best idea. She knows how to work me. Hey, I got some game. I know how to work her too. You got to do that on your LSGT. You cannot come to your principal and think, this is the way it's going to be, and if it ain't, I'm out of here. That is, that's what's wrong with Washington. We know that. Get together and be flexible. Okay, these are just things... These are big ideas. I'm just telling you things that are going to make it work because I've been there and done that for a minute. The other thing I want to say is this. These guys are amazing, and I know you know now why. I respect them, love them, and appreciate what they do because they are fighting the good fight across the state of Georgia to make sure that our public schools, which educate 90% of the people in America— are functioning properly and remove old laws. Title 20 is that thick, guys. Criminal code is Title 16. School, that's the laws that, you know, you can't kill people. Murder, rape, rob, ag, ag assault. Title 20 is that thick. So we've got to get some flexibility so we can move. That's, people think, well, the board controls everything. No, they don't. The state controls 90% of it. They give us this 10% and say, all right, you can make some real big changes right in this. Nope, 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 not that area. This, nope, nope, just right there. That's all. So this gives us some flexibility to move. And that is what is a beautiful thing about our board in 2016 saying, you know what, we're going to go charter. Because guess what? They didn't have to. They didn't have to. They could have said, we're going to stay status quo, which is what? Keep it like it is. We ain't changing anything. This is the way it's going to be. It's the way it's always been, and we're staying. They could do strategic waiver. Back then it was IE squared. Strategic waiver says, we want to be waived from some things, but we ain't giving up control. We ain't having those LSGT things, people coming in here telling us what to do. You know what your school system, your school board did? They said, we listen. That's why you're in here. We listen. We don't have to do this. They could just say, we're not going to do that. We don't want LSGTs. Why? Well, they'll just try to control the school, make it hard on the principal, another meeting. Nah. We want your involvement. Remember the partnership I said? The schools is more important than any other partnership in the world. The partnership between you and your doctor, you say, man, that's very important. No, it's not. You're going to go and tell him what it is. He's going to say, here's what you get. This partnership, guys, is a true partnership. And it works great when we're all on the same page and communicating and listening and doing what is best for whom? Kids, not teachers. Sorry, teachers. I've been one too. Not parents. Oh, Lord, help me. There are parents who do a lot of things that are not best for their kid. I see it all the time. Ma'am, I told a lady one day she's going to try to get her kid out of trouble. 
I said, ma'am, you're going to communicate something when you leave my office with your kid. And that is, mom will come and get you out of trouble whenever you get in trouble. Or you're going to communicate to your child, you made a bad choice, and it breaks my heart, but you're going to suffer the consequences. You're going to get ISS so that one day you don't get five years in prison. Our job is not to do what's best for adults. Every decision you make in your LSG, you, let LSGT, you say, is this best for kids? Okay? When I was a kid, you had two choices in school. And I say it was probably like for most of you. Two choices. Take it or leave it. <laughs> That's about all you got. You come to school, take it or leave it. We don't do that. This gives your kids more choices than any other kids have ever had in the history of this county. And I can just say, you can go to online school. You can go to online school inside your school. You can go to your school. You can go to college one day. You can come here. You can go to Harrods. You can go to Ringo. You can do all kinds of things. There has never been more opportunities for kids in schools than there are today. We are flexible. We are nimble. And as Eric said, some schools might not have changed, but I promise you, this system has. Because when I went to school, you just got two choices. Let me tell you something. You show up, pass a class, or you fail. That's just about the way it worked. So I've asked Dr. Melissa Butler, who is amazing. She is our assistant superintendent, and she is phenomenal. And I have asked our CEO, Marissa Brower, who... Guys, let's be honest, she wrote this charter. She is phenomenal, and she helps so much with all of the charter things so I can do other things. And I love both of them, and they do a great job. I've asked him to come up here and, and talk a little bit about some different areas of flexibility in our system. Now, I want to talk about one while I give them a second to catch their thought. One of the greatest things that we did, and as far as I'm concerned, at the high school level was guys, we had kids who were off track. And I know some of this has felt kind of high schooly today for the elementary folks, and, and, and I get it, but in the end, we got to get them across that stage and put a diploma in their hand and help them get a job. We had kids, guys, who were transferring to LFO High School when I was a principal there. We had one year where we had 300 kids in and out of LFO, 50% of Fort Oglethorpe's rental property. They were moving in and out, 300. And people want to be in our school system. 85% of the people who live in this county don't work here. Half of them are in Hamilton County. But they want to be here because they love this community and they love our school system. 85%, that's a big number. So they were moving in and out, in and out, to try to stay here. Here's what I found. Of those 300 that moved in and out, half of them were off track to graduate before we ever got them. And you can only get four credits in a year at high school. And eight in a year, four first semester, four second semester, 28, you get a diploma. So I sat down and I said, I can't do it. I can't fix it. They don't, they, there's not enough sand in the glass for them. It's impossible to graduate this kid. I can't do it. He's 17 years old with five credits. He can graduate at 80. And all he needs is math, math, math. I can't put him in an elective and get him out of here. It was, I, I just, I couldn't get over it. It just broke my heart because, guys, there's nothing worse than when you're a principal and you sit down with a parent and their child and you see a kid who has no hope. You're talking about going home breaking your heart. I'd sit there and look at that kid and he just looked down. And oftentimes it was not his or her fault. Their mom had moved them all over the world and back, been divorced 50 times, and I just looked at the kid. I said, God bless his heart. He, he's, what am I going to do? So I want to tell you about an innovative thing we did. We moved the PLCs inside 
each high school. And we created something in those high schools called a Success Academy. Each school calls it something different. Ringgold has a tiger name. LFO has a warrior name. Heritage has a general name. But they do each one of them. And you know what they do? We said this, and I love it. Oh, have I got hope for you. Have I got hope for you. Regular schools, you can only go 55 miles an hour, buddy. Four credits and four credits. But at LFO, you can go 155 miles per hour. How do I do that? I'm going to put you in a program in our school where you go in there and all you do all day, you work as fast as you can. And you've got a teacher who will not put a governor on you and only let you do 55. But brother, you are on the Audubon here. You press that little pedal on the right as hard as you can, and I'm going to help get you out of here if you will do the work. LFO this last year had the highest graduation rate they've ever had. It ain't me. There's a new group there. Yes, amen. That's a good clap. That is what Dr. Plunkett is talking about, doing something innovative to help kids, not help adults. To help kids. It's one of the favorite things I felt like we've done as a community, and it's at all three high schools, and it is working well. And it's not just increasing the graduation rate. It's changing the lives of kids. That's a kid now who can go get a job, and it's a beautiful thing. All right. Who wants to talk first? All right, so one thing that we did with our charter system flexibility recently this year is um, with the leadership certification in our district. So um, the state changed the requirements in the, in the recent years where normally or in historically, um, if you were a teacher, you could get a leadership degree and be paid for it and still teach. But they changed it to where you could no longer do that. So what we found was that a lot of our really good teacher leaders were not adding advanced degree in leadership um, because they didn't get paid for it unless they had a job in leadership. And so, you know, that was affecting how many people we had who were certified as leaders or able to be leaders. And one thing that we do really well in Catoosa County is we have a strong leadership pipeline. And Ms. Melinda Christman, if you're unfamiliar with her, she leads that. And they um, choose a cohort about every year and a half of teacher leaders throughout our buildings. Um, and they go to about 15 sessions with her where they get phenomenal experience. We did it, and I would say I, we both have advanced degrees in leadership, and we also did the Leadership Academy. And I would say by far the Leadership Academy gave me better experience to be a leader. Um, you develop relationships. You see how our system works and what we do for our kids. And we know that having the best leaders in our building is one of the best things we can do for kids. It changes everything about school culture and climate. And so what we did this year is we used our strategic waiver um, and our flexibility as a charter system to say if a teacher leader went through that cohort and graduated from that Leadership Academy pipeline in our district, then that waives um, the tier one certification and they could be a building level AP or principal without having to go back to school and get um, a six to eight thousand, ten thousand sometimes degree. And it also allowed us to choose the very best people to be leaders. Yes, I have my own mic. So, uh, <laughs> I'm not surprised. <laughs> so when Superintendent Nick said he asked us to come up here, like, just now. She has no <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> so I'm going to um, see if I can get to when Dr. Plunkett was talking. Okay, there we go. That's what I wanted to talk to from. Okay, so I have had the privilege of being involved in the charter system work from the very beginning. And I'm going to tell you, I love being a charter system. I just got back from the charter system conference. I love charter system flexibility because I'm not a, a career educator. And so when I came into education and there were rules and, and you know, my first career was in sales and marketing. And when you're in sales and you don't do well, you really don't have many rules. So there's a lot of rules in education. And then when we had the opportunity to say, we can be a charter system and we can focus on what helps kids be successful, I'm telling you, I loved that. And so I love and I um, have told people I've enjoyed seeing the progression of the charter system work. 
So um, Dr. Plunkett mentioned um, the surveys that we do. And I have been at the Board of Education since 2005, and I love how our board wants to listen to our stakeholders. I mean, that, that is what this board is founded on, and they truly want to listen and to respond to what is important to our community. So we did this survey before we submitted our um, new charter system application because we wanted to listen, you know, what was, what's important to you now? We knew that the community had told us that a college and career academy was important. We were ready, this was something that our community needed. And I worked with Dr. Plunkett. She's, she's been supporting me for many years now, and she's always ready to take my calls and answer my questions and walk me through things. And she said, Marissa, she said, you know, your college and career academy is going to be the major part of your innovation for your new charter system application. And I said, but other people are doing that. So a, char a college and career academy is not really that innovative. How do we make it innovative? So we worked together to come up with a plan to do a K-12 focus on college and career success. So um, this, this academy is really represents a paradigm shift in our system because we're not just focused on students graduating. We love when LFO has a, a great graduation rate, the best ever. Our graduation rate in our county is great, but we want to know that our students are prepared for what's next. And when we listened to our community on this survey, you told us that that was what was important to you, that you as a community wanted to know that students could graduate from our school system and that they were ready to go to college or they were ready to go into a career. But you know what? That doesn't just start in high school. That doesn't start with our from here to career class in ninth grade. That has to start all the way back into elementary school. Because when you ask elementary school teachers, what, our students what they want to be, they're going to want to be doctors or teachers or law enforcement. They want to be what they've seen. But there are so many careers that they've not seen. So we want to focus in elementary school on helping our kids just see all the opportunities that are out there for them. In middle school, we want them to have a little bit more experience. And you know what you also told us on this survey? Our students need to have financial awareness. So we had a great opportunity and we partner with the Junior Achievement Discovery Center in Dalton. So in sixth grade, our students go to BizTown and they learn about uh, running a business. And we had a great example one time, uh, for the first year we went, which was a couple of years ago, a mama called us and said, you know what? My son ironed his shirt tonight in case he was gonna be CEO tomorrow. And so they do that in sixth grade. In seventh grade, they go to Finance Park and they learn how to manage money. And then in ninth grade, after they've taken their From Here to Career class, we do something called Reality U in partnership with the Chamber of Commerce and Communities and Schools. So our students have had one semester in ninth grade. It's the first time they've ever learned about a GPA. And then they get a budget based on their lifestyle survey you know, what they want their career to be, their GPA, they have a certain amount of money that they get to spend and they have to go through a simulation where they have to choose housing and transportation. They have to pay for their student loan. They have to pay for credit card debt. They have to buy their food and they have to have they, they have to have at least a zero balance. They can't go in negative at the end of the month. So they are learning a real life simulation of what it's like to be an adult. And we had a student say, you know what, I'm going to go home and thank my mom and dad because I had no idea what they were doing. So I tell you that about middle and high school. And then they, come, they get the opportunity to come here when they are an 11th and 12th grader. And I'm going to tell you, most every child in this building is dual enrolled. So they are in college because our board's commitment to you is that we are truly preparing students for college and career. And the only way we can do that is if they're in college. And if they're getting those technical college certificates, so they're prepared to go into a career. And so the next thing we're gonna be doing is backing up to elementary school. And so we will be partnering more in the next two years with our elementary schools and listening to our LSGTs to get your input about how we can use our flexibility to prepare our elementary students to, you 
you know, for all the great things that are out there for them that they may not have never even thought of. So you'll be hearing a lot more in the next two years about what we're doing for elementary school. Aren't you glad you didn't give me time to prepare? <laughs> <laughs> you did a great job. <laughs> Dr. Plunkett? You know what Marissa talked about with this K-12 career focus? That's not easy, y'all. That is not easy. And you've really taken this on as a community and as a school system and as a board. And I love that because if your community is anything like the community that we live in or Eric lives in, we have kids who don't see people go to work. They don't see careers. They don't understand what that means. So what we're going to do, go back one for me, please. Okay, what we're going to do is I'm going to give you homework if you promise me you'll do it. Do you promise me you'll do it? Okay. All right, so here's what we're going to do. What I'd like is for y'all to, I'm going to have to back up over here so I can see it. Huh? Yeah, it's way at the end. Way, way, way at the end. Oop, go back. There you go, right there. All right, so what I've done is I've put your mission up here for your school district, and your mission is to prepare every child to reach their full potential so they graduate prepared to be good citizens and leaders of the future. That's a mouthful, and that's a handful. So what I'd like for you to do at your next meeting is to take what we've talked about today, this idea of doing what's good for kids, this idea of working together, of tearing down silos, of not working as individual silos of schools, but working as a district, thinking about using your flexibility, getting rid of all those things that are in law that are getting in your way, thinking about using your school governance teams to think to solve challenges, to, to solve problems. So what I want you to do at your next meeting, think of a challenge or a problem that you have. And that could be as a school, it could be in your school community, it could be um, in your community as a whole, it could be in your school system. But think about what would one of those challenges would be that you'd like to, to really kind of take on. Um, think about what would happen if you don't address this because I think that's a Im pretty important question as well sometimes we think it'll go away they don't ever go away hardly ever so think about what would happen if you don't address this challenge that you're facing in your school or your school community or your community at large then I want you to think of some ways that you can use flexibility that you can do things differently that you think about what you've been doing that wasn't working how you can sort of throw that out and come up with some newer ways or some more effective ways of working so that it helps to address that challenge or solve those problems for your kids. And then I'd like for you to think about what's this gonna look like. Now I would tell you in this college and career academy, that didn't just pop up one day and Marissa said, oh, now I know what the college and career academy looks like. I mean, we had a lot of conversations a lot of conversations. We still have a lot of conversations because the work you're doing doesn't stay stagnant. If it does, then you're not doing the work. And that's important to remember. And then I want you to think about what are gonna be the outcomes for your kids? What do you want your kids to get from this? Whether it's something that you're doing in literacy, whether it's something you're doing in leadership, whether it's something you're doing in college and career readiness, whether it's something you're doing and teaching kids how to work in teams, regardless of what it is. What are gonna be those desired outcomes? And then, and I think this is a really important question, um, how is your student, or your uh, school governance team going to help make this work? And I challenge the board as well to do this because when we start working on your renewal application in tw for 2027, we're going to be looking at things exactly like this. And this is how we got to where you are right now. Because what you did in your first contract out didn't look anything at all like what you're doing now. And it takes work and it takes time to learn things. And sometimes you don't know what you don't know. 
So if you promise me that you will take this back and at your next meeting, talk about it, then we're going to go home earlier than 12 o'clock, okay? Does that sound all right? All right, I just want you to know you have three huge fans of Catoosa County right here. I mean, we really are. I feel like I belong to y'all because I've, I've been up here so long and so much. And um, I love your community and I love everything that y'all are doing. And I just think you, you just, I thank you so much. And especially to you school governance team members, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for the work you're doing. Thank you to the board and to your superintendent, to everybody in this room. You are absolutely rocking it and I appreciate it. So I'm gonna turn this back over to your superintendent and to close us out. Hey guys, you know what? I love these folks. Like I said, they are fighting the good fight. We would not have what we have. We would not be where we are. And we would not be serving kids the way we're serving kids without their support. Will you please give them a huge round of applause for me? So, Mr. Bradford, you had a question. I'm so glad you asked. That was not planned. I did not send him a text while I was sitting over here and tell him to do that, guys. That was completely spontaneous. Here's what you can do to help. When you know better, what? You do better. To whom much is given, much is required. You've been given a lot today. And you're in a position of unbelievable privilege in your school. In a lot of ways, you are like the school board for your principal, like the board is for me. Here's what you can do. Say, speak. Say, speak. Say, speak. It's about like fifth grade. Up. Guys. Public education is in a battle like I've never experienced. Probably somebody said it's kind of like the 60s all over again. Well, I wasn't around then, but I, things I see about it were pretty rough. I need you to speak up. Where? Where is the forum where everything in the world takes place now? Mostly Facebook, mostly for us old people. If you're young and you have an Instagram account, you're cool and hip. If you see somebody talk about your school, that's your school. It's not my school. I've already been to school. This is your school. Speak up for your school. I tell our principals and teachers this all the time. It kills me when I see our schools just bashed. Or public education just bash when I know how hard they work. My wife is a teacher. My daughter is a teacher. I want to say, you know what? Put your Facebook phone down and come and sub. It ought to be a rule that you cannot criticize a school unless you have subbed in it first. You know, that's what I need you to do. Now, when you speak up, be nice. Be professional, but love your principal. Love your principal. It's the hardest job in the world. Love your teachers. I dare you. How many of you in here have ever been a substitute teacher? Raise your hand. One, two, three, four. We give them a hand. I'll tell you this. When I was a police officer, I said, I'm going to be a sub. So I paid my 50 bucks, went over to the county office, and got my sub license. Went to the sub class. Guess how many days I subbed? One day. <laughs> One day at Ringo Primary School, I subbed. I said, I'm done subbing. <laughs> it's a tough job. Love your teachers. Love those in it. Are they a perfect bunch of people? We're not perfect, guys. I know we're not. But I can tell you 99.9% .9 of us are doing the best we know how. And please, speak up and support your principal, support your teachers, and support your school. 
And with that, am I missing anything, guys? Board members, am I missing anything? Have I not said anything you guys won't say? It? No? No? For everyone that's here. Thank you for everyone that's here. Amen. That's a great note to end on. Thank you so much. Have a great